to welcome Milton Smith here at Overs Upsec Research. Uh, he has been volunteering. Well, oh, let's say Milton is the uh, senior uh, product manager for Java secure for for security for the Java platform at Oracle. Correct. Is it, is it correct? Yeah. The description because it's kind of lengthy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, security PM is good enough. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, he volunteered to come uh, to our conference and uh, tell us a little bit about the current state and what's going to happen in the future with Java in res with respect to security. He also has been talking at Black Hat, as far as I understood. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, but he's not t talking about client security only, but also about other stuff, I think. Yeah, correct. Okay. Um, so really what this is, uh, thank you, thank you. Um, so here I am, right here. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, really around uh, our policies and why we do some of the things we do that are perhaps not uh, clear to folks, as well as um, uh, talk about some of our recent progress in Java security and uh, remediation, things like that, as well as some of the new features uh, that we've been delivering on, which I don't think uh, a lot of folks are aware of. So. Um, you know, I think uh, that's a reasonable place to start. Uh, anyway, here's my role. Um, I think the point, I know that this stuff is covered in the program, so I'm not going to go over it a lot. But um, so uh, there's a lot of folks that do security on the Java team. Uh, I'm not the only one. Uh, probably like, um, like many of you, uh, I'm an influencer on the team. Developers don't report directly to the security guy. Uh, I have to fight the good fight, just like uh, many of you, perhaps. Um, now, one thing I would say, though, is uh, I do get a lot of support. Um, so I uh, work directly with uh, VPs in engineering as well as uh, uh, engineering leadership um, for the teams that develop crypto and, and things like that. So here we go. So we're going to talk a little bit about Java. Um, so uh, one thing when Oracle asked me to come uh, help out with security leadership for Java, um, you know, I said, oh, sure, Java, great. Um, uh, but, you know, what is Java? You know, I guess I'm uh, perhaps like many of you, I'm an application developer at heart, so I'm used to using Java SE and Eclipse and things like that. But actually, there's, uh, there's a lot of things to Java and uh, not understanding where everybody is at in their understanding. I figured I would uh, just kind of briefly uh, cover some of those things. So um, Java is a um, is a combination of different things. So Java is a specification that really is paperwork and things that describe uh, what is Java, right? And if you were to build Java, what Java must conform to. And so that is uh, specifications uh, driven largely by uh, the Java community process. And uh, Java community process, uh, which is an open process that anybody can participate in public, uh, drives the implementations. Um, and the implementation of Java would be uh, like the compiler, Javac, and Javadocs, all that sort of stuff. Um, really the, the, the thing that implements the specification. From a uh, implementation perspective, um, uh, you know, the Java is much of Java's open source as well, the OpenJDK project, which you uh, may or may not have seen. But uh, if you want uh, to start working on your own version of Java SE, you can do that. You can go to the OpenJDK project and decide you're going to go on your own and just download the whole project and create your own version of Java. It's up to you. Uh, or you can contribute to, um, to what's there. So, Maybe a little bit about uh, uh, you know where Java is at, right? We, you know, a lot of us, uh, perhaps some are .NET users out there. Um, not, I can't assume everybody's Java user, but uh, Java is deployed on about 97% of desktops. Um, you can see the mobile platforms very significant. Television sets about a billion downloads a year, nine million developers. So it's, uh, uh, and again, I just grab these because being a, an apps guy, I wanted to know, okay, well, really, how, how big is Java? I know I use it a lot. I, you know, I uh, deploy things onto app servers like Tomcat, but, you know, how are other people using it? And in fact, there's a lot of different ways uh, in Java's used, and 
Uh, and now that I'm really part of the creation of the, now that I'm part of the platform team, um, I see all sorts of different innovative uses. I'm getting Java to run on uh, $35 Raspberry Pi computers. Uh, it's pretty amazing what you can, all the different uses people come up with. One of the things here before I start talking about um, all the things that uh, we've been doing is I guess I would just share a little bit about um, uh, some Java security uh, news here. So um, not long ago, our chief architect, uh, Mark Reinhold, uh, uh, published a blog that really talked about delaying JDK 8. So a lot of you probably know that we've had some different uh, security issues with Java. And uh, we've been really sort of hunkering down to get those addressed and has even pushed back the release of JDK 8 while we get those things cleaned up. And um, so anyway, this is uh, a message that uh, our architect, chief architect, uh, communicated to the public to let, to let people know. So um, what are we doing in Java security? Well, it's, uh, it's uh, pretty simple, really. Uh, you know, we're accelerating remediation and, uh, and uh, you know, crunching through backlog, getting, getting bugs fixed, things like that, as well as developing new security features to keep the platform safe. Um, so Java was, uh, originally came out around 1995, and of course the, the uh, threats and things that were in 1995 are uh, far different than they are today, right? So uh, this is really about bringing Java up to speed. Um, defending uh, Java applets, I guess really that one I kind of see plugging into the other two, um, but, but really um, uh, Java applets has emerged as a, um, an area of concern. Uh, we've noticed more exploits and things in that area, so we've been focusing on that a lot. So now we'll kind of segue a little into um, a little bit on security policies. So the policies that we have uh, at uh, Oracle apply to all Oracle products and, and Java uh, being a platform, uh, one of those uh, applies as well. So the, the three larger areas for the policies are really uh, communications, remediation, as well as uh, integration with the lifecycle. And, um, and so these are kind of some of the key areas around those three larger areas that we'll talk a little bit more about. So, so in regards to communications, um, we have a lot of ways that we, that we let the public know what's going on. Um, so we, uh, whenever we, we have security alerts, that's one of, uh, I guess that would be our security hot fixes. And uh, we have RSS feeds and things that you can subscribe to for security alerts um, so that when they come out, you're appraised uh, immediately. Uh, critical patch advisories, those are our normal security patches for Java. Um, and those are also available via um, uh, RSS feeds and things like that. E-blasts are just uh, email distribution lists that you can subscribe to. And uh, there's a lot of blogs as well. So there's a security assurance blog that is uh, written by a colleague of mine, Eric Maurice. Um, you might want to take a look at that. Um, a lot of times uh, when there's uh, CPU releases and security alerts and things like that, he will kind of capture, um, I guess, a, you know, uh, more of a summary of it. So when we, whenever we publish CPU uh, uh, critical patch updates, um, there's uh, documentation that we ship with that, which kind of describes a little bit about the uh, the vulnerabilities that are being addressed and which um, categories they fall into and things like that. Um, so there's very technical documentation, whereas uh, Eric's blog is kind of a little more uh, human readable, I guess. And then uh, the Java PM blog, which is something new for us. Uh, and you don't have to you know, try to Google all this stuff right now. So I've included a bunch of links at the end of the presentation. And I'll share the presentation with the OWASP team. And um, that way, you can just uh, refer to those links. Um, so in regards to uh, communications, a lot of people ask me, well, um, you know, can you tell me a little bit more about this vulnerability that you just had and, you know, where is it and, okay, now you've told us and, um, you know, can you share the POC with us that shows us how to, you know, it's like, um, we, you know, 
we would love to be, we've, we're, we are very open, as I had said in the you know, first few slides there, we are very open with our source and open JDK. We typically um, do not talk about vulnerabilities before we've actually checked in the fixes, right, and made them available to everybody because if we shared vulnerability information with a select few and not with everybody else, uh, it might put the community at risk, right? Mm -hmm. So correcting corroborating articles, um, again, yeah, that provides a lot more information to attackers. So if, um, you know, they want to say things about Java in computer world or whatever, pick your favorite, um, you know, tech magazine, you know, we really can't comment on that. Um, you know, a lot of times those, those articles will come out in the press and people will come to me and say, hey, Milton, you know, what about this article that I read over here? Can you tell me about that? And it's like, you know, I, I, I can't really do that. I can't say whether it's, you know, whether it's true or whether it's false or, um, and the other thing is a lot of times I can't even really say that this thing that they're talking about uh, is the same thing um, that we're, you know, publishing a CPU about because a lot of times news articles in particular uh, like to, you know, they're, they're just short on the engineering details, right? Um, and, and that's what I'm all about. I'm part of a, a development group. Um, you know, we, it's our job to, uh, to build and to fix Java and keep it safe. And, you know, we run on engineering details. So if something doesn't have engineering details that we need, I really can't comment on it. So I don't. Um, the other thing I would say is um, social media, commenting on social media that's, that's flying around. Um, uh, you know, if we engage, we definitely engage in social media, but I think if we, for the purposes of vulnerability, start chatting about things uh, on social media, um, then it forces people to monitor social media in order to get Oracle News. And so I think the best place to communicate Oracle News is on an Oracle site. Um, so I think uh, all this boils down to is, uh, you know, the way that we do things with our communication policy on uh, communicating about alleged product vulnerabilities is that everybody gets this news at the same time and it's precise and it's actionable. Um, so, you know, this, okay, what the, so I wanted to just kind of show, now this is really kind of a, uh, I guess a, uh, not a particular, any particular uh, SDLC meta methodology that I'm pr proposing. And I know when I've showed this in the past, I, I had somebody tell me, yes, Milton, you know. And when I saw this come up, to me it looked old, because uh, we do agile. And to me that looks like waterfall. And so I'm not, uh, so I guess I'm not trying to communicate uh, waterfall over agile or, or anything like that. This is really the process that we use for developing that I'm sharing with you. And it might not be appropriate for web apps, what you're doing which, you know, agile processes would make a lot more sense if you're cloud apps, web apps, that sort of thing. Uh, but for a platform, uh, things are different on a platform. And, you know, our release cycles are quite a bit longer. And so this is really how we do things. Um, and I've just kind of picked a few things because it's hard to jam everything into a slide here. But just to show that, you know, we think about different things at different levels of the, of the development process. I know there's a lot of security um, uh, development life cycle sort of uh, stuff out there that you can choose from, uh, pick your favorite. But, um, but basically at the beginning of the uh, life cycle, you know, we'll look at the effort that engineering is doing and decide, um, try to make a dis an assessment of, uh, you know, what kind of risk that that generates. Uh, and that controls, you know, whether we spend more or less time on, on what they're doing. Uh, project review. Um, you know, we go ahead and review architecture documents uh, with an eye on compliance, um, peer review. Uh, we have engineers um, use different tools throughout their processes, probably like you would do, um, uh, static analysis tools, things like that. We also have uh, a lot of specialized tools that we've uh, developed in-house ourselves. Um, as you can imagine, working on a platform uh, is quite different than working on an application. Um, so, for example, an application you would be protecting for different uh, business use cases and things like that. Uh, for a platform, we don't know how it's going to be used. So how Java is used is up to you. And so defending that is, is a little bit different. And you can imagine 
Um, you know, I've had people ask me too, well, well Milton, do you use this uh, commercial tool so-and-so to do your analysis? And uh, we do use commercial tools uh, to, to do analysis. We use open source tools like FindBugs and things like that. Uh, but we have to use a lot of specialized tools because as you can imagine, uh, you know, some of the commercial tools do not support some of the forward-looking features that we're planning on building uh, into Java. So things like, uh, <coughs> we'll say like lambdas or, or things like that that are coming up in, in future versions of Java um, are not probably supported in these tools, at least officially. All right. And then the other point here is that even, you know, considering our engineering processes and how um, different uh, tools and technologies, procedures uh, touch the different phases of, uh, of our development processes for Java, we have things that operate outside of the process. Um, so we have all the security people and developers um, engaged in that process, but outside the process, we also have our, uh, I, re uh, I recorded, uh, or wrote GPS there, that's our um, global product security team, uh, which is more of a corporate security team. So uh, whereas like myself, I'm a very senior individual contributor for security uh, on the Java team, um, I by no means, um, you know, necessarily a big fish at Oracle, right? So there's a lot of uh, 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 security leadership on the corporate side and, you know, we work closely with them. That's the global product security people. And, uh, and they definitely have a lot of opinions about Java security and, and things like that. So they, they are outside the process and, and kind of um, have different checkpoints and engage us uh, on our architectures and things like that. We have uh, ethical hacking teams, which are outside the process as well. And um, will kind of kick the tires of Java and try different things and, uh, and let us know what their results are and we'll have our technical people look at those. We have a lot of training. Uh, anybody that touches code on the Java team, probably like your companies, has to go undergo some basic uh, security training. We also have more specialized training so that when we have uh, exploits, um, we typically have kind of this post-mortem procedure of what we call anatomy of an exploit. Where we kind of uh, have one of our senior technology leaders sit down and really kind of show how this, uh, you know, kind of a play-by-play -play of what happened for the uh, developers um, so that they can, you know, perhaps, um, you know, use that information to, to change what they're doing in the future. And then we have uh, tech talks, which are just um, regularly scheduled technology discussions, uh, and that also includes security, and I have uh, one coming up here in, in September for the team I'm going to be talking about. Uh, so for remediation, uh, we've got a lot of, uh, uh, so for remediation, we use uh, a system called Con Common Vulnerability Scoring System, CVSS. You may have, uh, some of you might use it. I know governments uh, sometimes use it. Uh, but it's, way, it's a way to classify vulnerabilities uh, based on risk um, using sort of uh, standardized metrics to uh, come up with a aggregate score. Um, if the lower the number is, the less riskier something is, the higher the number, the more risk. And it's just, a, you know, I, I would say, you know, there are, as much as they try to make it structured, um, there, you know, there's always a little wiggle room in there. Why is this a 5.5 versus uh, maybe a 6? Um, um, but, but I think the, you know, a general, you know, system for communicating risk quickly and a conversation between uh, two engineers is, is a healthy thing to have. So we use uh, CVSS to do that. Uh, we have a special um, vulnerability triage team. Whenever reports are reported to Oracle, we don't just assume that they're true. Uh, we have to actually go in and, and check them out. Uh, at that time that they're checked out, if they're confirmed positive, they are assigned to CVSS score and then go off for uh, remediation to be scheduled. And then, of course, uh, you know, if we have a higher risk item, high CVSS score, um, you know, that would take priority over, over lower items because we uh, remediate things just like you do, perhaps, uh, based on risk. Fix the highest, uh, most critical things first. And then um, the way that we deliver those things is, uh, as I had mentioned before, so CPU, you thought you knew what a CPU was. Well, 
if you were at Oracle, you'd be wrong because the CPU is a critical patch update. So that's our regular security patches. For the Java team, uh, we've been doing, uh, I think we've been on a, a, a three mm -hmm. sort of delivery per year schedule, but we are now moving to uh, Oracle's uh, delivery schedule of four per year. And uh, so perhaps, uh, you know, thinking about it, well, from my greedy security perspective, I get one more slot I can deliver fixes to, so I like that. I think from a customer perspective, those folks that are using Java, if you were uh, scheduling uh, outages for your data centers and things like that, um, well, now the Java delivery is on the same time as the delivery for all your other products, so maybe you only have to schedule a single outage, so uh, there's probably some benefits there. For um, security alerts, uh, those are uh, emergency security patches or hot fixes. They're not a, something regular. Those are where we see uh, exploitation in the wild and we need to come out with something very quickly. Um, and, uh, and that's the mechanism that we use to do that. We don't like to do that as much uh, where we don't have to because, you know, Java is, uh, whenever we remediate something, um, you know, we don't just fix it on the platform, it's reported, you know, so if we see it on Windows, we also check Mac too. Uh, sometimes what's on Windows is a vulnerability on Mac as well, so we, we check different platforms as well as also different versions. So if we see something on 7U25, we're also going to check, um, you know, Java 6 and some of the older versions of Java 2. So if, uh, if you have support for Java for older versions, you would get that fixed as well. Um, so this is just a little bit about how the critical patch update works. The um, patches alternate between a non-CPU and CPU um, so that the non-CPU is where, where we deliver software features and things like that, uh, whereas a CPU is really just security features. So we're trying to, we're trying to limit our security fixes to only introducing uh, security features, uh, excuse me, security um, vulnerability fixes. Uh, you know, and the idea is there is that um, uh, we understand that when, you know, you apply a security patch, there's always a chance uh, there's operational risk with any patch that you install. And so by uh, limiting a CPU to only security fixes, the idea is that, um, you know, it reduces your operational risk. Now I would say, so this year we've uh, kind of bent the rules on some of that, but this year has been an extraordinary year for Java, right? And, um, and you know, we've had to make some changes to keep the community secure, and in the best interest of doing that, uh, we've used uh, CPUs in a few cases to also deliver key security features. That's not something that we like to do, though. Um, okay. Uh, CPUs uh, are generally published in advance too. We've had more CPUs this year. For example, in February, we had two CPUs back to back, um, which you know creates uh, a little pain on on uh, data centers that have to install two of them very quickly. Um, you know, we understand that. I think from a from a platform developer perspective, um, you know, we. Uh, we have to deliver the fixes that it takes to keep the community safe. So that's what we'll do. Um, we don't necessarily, you know, dictate when those fixes are installed. Each, each company has to make their own, uh, or organization has to make their own operational choices. Sure. That really, uh, <laughs> you ask the easy questions. <laughs> so, not every, you know, so we have pro policies that dictate our remediation. And, uh, you know, but quite frankly, some, some things are easy to fix and other things are more difficult to fix, right? The other thing is, as I had mentioned before, um, you know, not only do we just fix it on the platform that it's reported on, but we have to fix it, you know, across all platforms and older versions of Java as well. Um, so, uh, you know, what might be uh, considered a very easy fix actually could take much longer to fix, uh, to, to address it systemically, right?
Okay, so now we'll just kind of really uh, talk more about the progress. Uh, so we talked a little bit about policy, which I like to, to cover just because it helps people understand why we do some of our things. Because if I don't talk about that, people always ask at the end of the presentation, why did you do this? So uh, I think it perhaps is more satisfying to cover that. Um, okay, so for remediation highlights, um, Java applets running at browser in browsers. Uh, I think that's one of the areas that has uh, emerged as a as something uh, more concerning um, it, that have been exploited more often, um, and as well. So that's one of the areas that we focus on. But I think the thing is, is even though that we focus on uh, Java running in the browser, uh, we care about all areas of Java that would be vulnerable. Um, so if there are um, you know, vulnerabilities that affect the server, we're, we're interested in those. It's just that we have focused uh, on, the, on the browser. And the other thing I think the data that will, that will show here is that there's been some significant progress over the course of the last year. Um, so this is just, uh, um, this information um, comes from information that's publicly available. Um, if you uh, look at the CPU notes that are published for each release, uh, at the bottom, there's what we call a risk matrix. And the risk matrix shows, like, it lists out each vulnerability um, that's being addressed by the CPU. And it lists the um, subcomponent that um, that vulnerability impacts, you know, if it's 2D graphics library or that sort of thing. And then um, uh, the uh, version of Java, the, you know, a lot of the details. And so the interesting thing is uh, you can go through those details and kind of tally things up. And so that's what I did. Um, so one of the things I just looked at was um, remediated vulnerabilities per month. Um, and this is kind of, um, you know, this isn't necessarily specific. Not every uh, release is included. But what I've tried to do is kind of show roughly the time across the bottom over the course of a year. And then a few milestones that would indicate, um, you know, releases that might map to those years, which you know you might be able to identify more with. And then um, remediated vulnerabilities up the left-hand side. So you could see, um, you know, earlier last year, you know, for 7U5, we were, you know, remediating around, um, you know, 15 or so for a 13 to 15 for a CPU. Uh, you know, and that's what we think we could do th at that time. And then, of course, it. Uh, in the Octoberish of 2012, wrap, ramped up to um, around 30, and then, of course, uh, you know, last uh, earlier this year, um, you know, we're up to about 55 or so in 7U15. So we've really, um, you know, that right there is uh, from the web, and you know, that shows, um, you know, progress uh, working on what we've been doing here for the last year. This right here is kind of interesting. So uh, as I had mentioned, if you go through the risk matrix and you look at uh, these different uh, subcomponent types, um, you can then go through and put everything into maybe an Excel spreadsheet and kind of you know, do your little what ifs. And uh, the one thing that I noticed is that uh, the data does uh, support our, uh, you know, the applets in the browser, right? So on the left-hand side, we have deployment, which is the applet area. Uh, libraries, 2D, uh, AWT, of course, is also down there. The thing that I noticed was Dash. I was not sure what that was, but Dash was like coming up kind of high. But uh, Dash is really, uh, I guess, a um, kind of a catch-all because there's some uh, areas of Java that don't necessarily have a component subtype, which is what these things are. And uh, so I just kind of looked up one because I wanted to see what that is because it seemed to be a big bucket things were going into. but. Uh, there was some things that emerged, like Javadocs, for example. Javadoc is, you know, um, doesn't really have a component subtype, so it's assigned this dash. But anyway, uh, you can basically see that over on the left-hand side, um, that's where the, uh, you know, the applet picture emerges. Um, and that's not to say that, you know, some of those. Ten minutes. Okay, thanks. Try to go faster. Um, okay. So what we're going to cover now is a little bit on the security features that we've delivered on since uh, last September or so. Um, so if we start here, 7U10 in December, uh, we added an enable disable feature for Java because pr prior to that it was not easy to just uh, turn off Java, right? We, 
you know, had to tell people how to deactivate it, registry settings, it's different between Windows and Mac and different platforms, and it was hard to explain. So, you know, I guess we could tell people to uninstall Java, but that's kind of brute force too. Um, so we came up with enable disable. Anyway, easy way to do it now. Um, Hard-coded uh, best before date on JRE. What that is, is uh, Java will now understand if it's running uh, below the security baseline. So if a new CPU comes out, Java understands that it's old. Um, it hasn't been patched. So when it communicates uh, warnings and things to the user, it's going to create um, uh, c communicate warnings with uh, maybe slightly more emphasis uh, or higher risk than it did before because it knows it's out of date. Uh, Java security slider, that's something else that we added in 7U10, which allows uh, uh, people to uh, set their sort of appetite for risk, uh, risk uh, operational versus um, security trade-offs um, for Java running in browsers. Uh, we added support for signing sandboxed applications um, in 7U21, so what that's about is, uh, and actually that's um, it's kind of a subtle but significant change uh, that's caused some confusion because um, prior um, to the change, uh, signing also meant uh, giving privileges. And really, signing is about establishing identity. And so what we've done is to separate the part of, of uh, assigning identity of the code author to giving privileges. So now those are two separate things. Uh, server JRE. Um, server JRE was really um, developed. Uh, it, it, for now, it just pulls plugin support out of uh, out of Java. So, uh, if you were to uh, deploy server JRE on the server side, um, uh, there's no plugin support. So there's no question about some of the vulnerabilities that might impact a plugin. Um, would they impact your server? That sort of thing. Uh, we also, in 7U21, removed support for low and custom on the security slider. Um, you know, what we discovered is after we added the slider, um, people wanted the setting of go back to Java the way it used to be sort of thing. And we just, we didn't want to do that because uh, we had noticed that people would kind of throttle the, uh, throttle Java back and uh, be more vulnerable and then be exploited. So, um, so we removed the uh, ability to to kind of turn things back to the old ways. So dynamic blacklisting in 7U21 was uh, a, a feature that we added. So, uh, so we had some blacklisting capabilities. And what that is, is uh, it allows us to, uh, if, if there's a vulnerable jar, it allows us to blacklist that jar so that it can't be used with Java. Um, the dynamic blacklisting capability allows us to update those blacklists uh, daily for Java users. Um, and uh, previously, uh, we could only update the blacklist when a new binary for Java was shipped. Uh, so now we have some more flexibility here. Yes? How does that affect us building Java server applications or Java applets? How do we get that blacklist to take effect in our applications? Yeah, yeah, it is actually. Um, so you know what, right now, I think this is an important feature because it allows us, what we've been doing is really working with uh, commercial software providers. So we'll say the scenario is they pushed out a new version of their product. They realize that their product has a jar with a vulnerability in it. Um, so uh, they would communicate to us what that is and we kind of go through a process and we get that blacklisted and kills it everywhere. It's you know, I think dynamic blacklisting is far better than what was there before, um, but I still think it's uh, it not really where it should be because in my mind it puts us kind of like in the position where we're the only CA that can, you know, blacklist a certificate, so to speak, right? It's just not a very good position to be in. So I think uh, one of the areas that we're looking into the future is, um, you know, more of a distributed feature which would allow anybody to blacklist their own. So if you um, you know, if you had discovered that, um, you know, you had some vulnerable code out there and now that code is out in the wild, you would then, um, there'd be some mechanisms to be able to blacklist your own. That's, you know, it's still on the table at this point. We're discussing it, but that's kind of uh, things that we're thinking about that would, um, you know, empower people to police their own uh, software. The other thing that we did for 7U25 is uh, we added some, um, uh, 
We added some logic here to prevent uh, jars from being repurposed. Uh, people would, you know, if you had a financial app or something, um, you might not want the code that's running on your servers to be able to be run somewhere else. Um, so we have some, um, some code here to prevent repurposing. Standardized revocation services in 7U25. So just as we're turning up the dials on code signing and signing for applets, um, we need um, standardized revocation services to be working. Um, they had been part of Java for, for a while, but they were turned off by default. And, uh, you know, they, I think they were, when they were developed, um, there were some performance concerns when they were turned on. So really, um, before I had the team turn these on, we, we went back to the drawing board and kind of took a look at these things. And, um, okay, thank you. Uh, worked with uh, uh, some different um, uh, CAs and things to try them out to see how, you know, interoperability testing with uh, CRL and OCSP services. And so those are basically the services when you uh, go to blacklist a certificate, um, you know, say somebody's signing some bad code and you want to turn that certificate off, this is, uh, this is what would do it on the client side for talking to those servers. Uh, Java uninstaller, um, this right here is an ongoing effort. Uh, what we've discovered is a lot of uh, times bad guys like to target um, old versions of Java on desktops because old versions have known vulnerabilities. And so if you, if you target those, you have a good chance of exploiting. Um, so we're developing, <coughs> we're developing our software installs and things to clean up those old versions of Java um, that are out there. Um, that's still a project. We have kind of a multi-step project. Um, so right now, some of the installer, the installer does some cleanup, but then also at the end of an install, we uh, drop users on an uninstaller page that can kind of clean up some things for Windows users. Um, you know, we're still not there yet. We have more work to do, but we're making some progress. Uh, dynamic rule set, DRS, a uh, new feature for uh, 7U40. Um, so the early access is available today. You can download it and try it out. Uh, effectively, uh, DRS adds uh, capabilities for enterprises to whitelist their corporate assets. Um, so if you wanted to you know, block some of these uh, malicious uh, applets and things from, <coughs> from uh, exploiting your desktops, It'd be kind of, you know, it's hard for enterprises to do that today, right? Because you just can't shut off port 80 and 443, right? That's not very tenable. So how do you, how do you let all that go through and only block the applets from the bad guys, right? Um, so this is perhaps a way that enterprise users can do that. So uh, what you can do is you can create a, a file that kind of mirrors your company policy. You can list the assets that you want your corporate desktops to be able to talk to. Um, and then also the uh, assets of perhaps partners. You know, if you partner with other businesses and things, you can include those assets in there. Uh, you can take that configuration file, sign it, push it down to your desktops, done. So that feature is available in 7U40 to play with today. It's publicly available, uh, but because it is early access still, until it actually comes out, you're, you know, we don't like people to deploy it in production, um, but, but go ahead and kick the tires and let us know what you think. The other thing is uh, making some progress here. Um, so we, our flagship conference is Java 1, um, and uh, it's coming right up here at the end of September. Um, I noticed uh, in submitting uh, last year for, um, for Java 1 to let people know who I am and kind of talk about security a little bit, uh, that there was no place for me to put my track. Uh, you know, I wasn't sure like which track I submitted on, and finally, I, I think I settled on core technologies. Um, but the other thing I noticed in going through the program is, hmm, there were a number of different security sessions, and they're not just all Oracle guys talking about security. It was, um, you know, people from, uh, you know, different parts of the world, different user groups. And so then I thought, um, well, hey, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on security. There's, you know, um, I'm here now, and um, so, you know, we should be doing, we should be calling it for what it is. Let's call all this security stuff security. So I asked the uh, conference team, hey, can we have a security track just like we have core technologies and these other ones? And, uh, and after some uh, talking, they finally said, sure, yeah, if you want to lead it, go ahead. <laughs> so I said, all right, well, sign me up. So I don't know anything about running a security track. I don't see myself as a uh, conference promoter. I'm, I'm really a, a tech, technical developer. That's, that's my comfort zone, I guess. 
But I felt like, um, you know, I've been a big OWASP proponent. Um, I haven't spoke, okay, two minutes. I haven't spoken to OWASP everywhere or anything like that. But um, at the time, I just felt like, uh, well, you know, I'd kind of like to bring some of that same great stuff that we do here at OWASP uh, maybe to developers. Because we're always saying as security professionals, um, you know, wouldn't it be great if developers knew these things that we knew? So that's the idea of, of Java 1 here is to kind of bring some of that security training to developers who may never otherwise attend a security conference. Uh, okay, so I only have two minutes. So I'm just going to fly through this. This is like extra. Um, these are all the links and good things that you can take a look at. So if you want to report vulnerabilities to Oracle, there's how you do it. Uh, new security features, you want to make some suggestions, you can send them there, or you can just send them directly to me too. That's fine. Um, Java platform uh, support. Um, yeah. So I get questioned on Java platform support all the time. Again, I'm really part of the development organization, so I don't know anything about sales. I don't know anything about support. I only bring this up because everybody asks about it. Um, uh, so I know, like, and, and when we deliver some of our um, fixes and things like that, sometimes um, we, we make some early um, things available to customers that have support. We publish that on the Oracle support site. So then the question comes up of how can I get it? So there it is. Um, Java root certificate program. So we have roots in Java like, um, like browsers have roots. Um, and we do have a program uh, if you want to get your root added to Java. Upcoming CPUs for, uh, for uh, the while there. Um, and uh, different things here that you can do to, uh, to help keep people safe. Um, and then again, these are all the links. That's it. That's all I've got. So I don't know if we have time for one or two questions or where you want to go. Certainly. <laughs> so shoot, guys. No, don't shoot. Ask, ask your question. <laughs> yes. Do you want to get them on the microphone? Or I don't know if it's being recorded. Or The first question is, how removing plugin on server should secure it? Sorry. Uh, how removing plugin from server Java could secure the server when there, are, there is no browser there? I cannot understand this. Yeah, well, there, you know, that's correct. OK, so this is where we get into, I think as a security professional, you know, we understand a lot more about security than um, you know, the average public, right? And uh, so some of these vulnerabilities that uh, impact uh, browsers, impact when you're running uh, uh, Java applets and browsers, really don't apply uh, too much on the server side. Um, but uh, that's not necessarily clear to everybody that that's the case because it's not clear uh, it, to them perhaps that you you know you need to be browsing to do these things that sort of thing. Um, but yes, um, because we don't typically browse on servers, um, you know these things uh, don't don't typically have the same sort of impact. But by eliminating the plugin, uh, it's you know uh, it's easier for uh, those people to understand. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to know the um, time frame for that dynamic rule set update that's currently in beta or whatever you said it was. What's that? The, the, sorry, sounds like I'm loud. Um, the time frame for that dynamic rule set update. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so if you look at the um, if you look at the the early access site. Um, it'll provide all the different features that are in 7U40. I just highlighted this, you know, the security things of interest. Um, uh, I believe, so the time, so the contents of the feature, the documentation for how to use it, and the delivery timeline for 7U40 is all online. If I remember right, it's mid-September, um, but I would really check the site for the, for the official word. You know, it might change a little bit. In terms of your development life cycle, your security development life cycle, um, Microsoft has kind of become the de facto reference because they publish so much about it out there that everybody's reusing it. Uh, does um, 
does Java have similar type vision of where they're going to go and uh, is this type of reference available publicly? So a lot of the things that we have um, around policy are available online and uh, you know I've, I've shared those in the presentation here so you can you can see I think it's actually quite unusual that a company would publish their security policies online um, but that's that's what Oracle does. Um, they also have some uh, documentation on STLC, uh, so you might want to look that up. Uh, I would say, you know, they're policy statements, though. They're not implementation, right? So, like, if you want to know about Microsoft's SDL, you can, you know, buy a book, right? Oracle doesn't have a book that corresponds to that. Um, but uh, there is a lot of good information out there. We do have things like um, secure coding guidelines, things like that. Um, so there are good published resources. I have a question also. You're next. Um, the, uh, We're all out of time. No. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't let you go, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, the, I'm not a developer uh, anymore. Well, uh, but uh, uh, naively speaking, shouldn't it be easy, I mean, to... Uh, get more security into your products. I don't know whether you do, so for example, static uh, code analysis or uh, code reviews. What's, what's going on there? So I think there's, uh, so perhaps that's a two-part question, right? Um, you know, what are we doing with static analysis um, for Java? And yeah, there are definitely tools that, uh, that we use. I guess we do more work with static analysis and fuzzers um, because we're developing a platform, right? So. Uh, doing dynamic analysis for us really doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, but we have lots of um, static analysis and custom fuzzers, font fuzzers, all sorts of different sort of fuzzers. Um, for, um, uh, for developers, we don't have like static analysis tools that we share with them. Um, you know, but there are a lot of good open source tools. Some of the open source tools that they could use, we use as well. Um, and then, of course, there's a lot of really great commercial tools out there that they can use. It's not somewhere in your product lifecycle or in your uh, software development lifecycle? Well, our software development lifecycle would apply to how we create our software. Um, but we don't dictate how somebody else should create their software. Yeah, yeah well, right. I was talking about your software. Oh, okay, you're talking about our software. Yeah, so we... Um, you know, like I said, we do have some policies that, that drive our software development lifecycle, and uh, we have static analysis tools and fuzzers, um, but, um, you know, we don't, um, I guess, go into detail about our static analysis tools, right, with, with the public. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One last question actually is related to what was asked just before, but was to get more information about the fuzzing that you are doing in your software development life cycle. If you can share that, of course. About? Um, the fuzzing. So you said that you do oh, static fuzzing? analysis and you do also fuzzing yeah. in, the, in the testing phase, right? So yeah. if you can elaborate a bit on that. Yeah, actually, so I can't elaborate, um, but there's others that have elaborated. <laughs> so, uh, so Mark Schoenfold, um, uh, is probably the best one to speak about that and um, he's uh, he's going to be at Java one speaking this year I'm trying to remember if he has something on fuzzers but I do uh, if I remember right he has something from last year uh, so if you check the Java one site um, take you know there's right after the conference we publish all the media like a lot of conferences do and if you weren't able to attend you can still get the value of the, the slides and the presentation materials and so um, so you might want to take a look for Mark Schoenfold and, um, uh, and, and look up his, I think he had something on fuzzing. Okay, thanks for the talk. Yeah, all right, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Privileged to be here. <laughs>